Well, good morning and welcome to Apex Church Online. We are so grateful for the goodness of God. I believe that from generation to generation, God reveals himself. He makes himself known. And my prayer is today that through the service that you will encounter him. I really want to encourage you, just don't look at the screen. As we worship God, why don't you raise your voice, raise your hands there at home in the privacy of your living room, kitchen, wherever you're watching, that we can encounter God. That's what I love about serving God, about worship and about praise. It's not about being in, quote unquote, the church building that we can only encounter God. It's not only about a Sunday, but it's about the fact that he's with us everywhere. He knows us, he sees us. So right now, in these moments, as we join with our church band, can we declare the goodness of God? Let's praise him.
Apostle Paul said these incredible words in Romans chapter 8, a scripture that we're very familiar with. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who can bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine or nakedness, danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long, we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, the Apostle Paul declared. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels, demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Aren't those beautiful words of encouragement? And to be reminded that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the darling of heaven, the Savior, the one who loves us, intercedes on our behalf at the right hand of the Father. I don't know what needs perhaps you have right now, what's going on in your world. It may be an area of sickness. It may be a financial challenge. It may be a family situation. Hey, I don't know, but God already knows. And I would love to come into agreement with you that we come not in the name of Neil Cameron, not in the name of Apex Church, but we come in the name of Jesus. And the Bible says that when we come in His name, we know that the Father hears us. Come on, let's pray together. Father God, I thank You for the beauty of this moment that we know that we are accepted in the Beloved, that we're reminded by the Apostle Paul that in all these things we are more than conquerors, not in ourselves, but through Christ Jesus who loved us, that nothing is able to separate us from the love of Christ. And Father, the love of God found in Christ. And Father, I pray right now that in this moment that you would speak to hearts, whatever people are dealing with, whatever people are going through, whatever challenge is happening in their world, wherever, Lord, there's a situation that would bring fear or doubt or intimidation, whatever the enemy would try to bring against us, that we wouldn't stand in the promises of God, reminded that Jesus Christ is at the right hand of God the Father, and He's interceding on our behalf. So right now, Father, I pray for sickness. I pray for situations of bereavement. Father, I pray, Lord, for people that are struggling with issues that would try to condemn them and pull them down, that, God, that you would speak into every situation into every home that hears my voice, into every situation where there is challenge, on the mountaintop or valley, I pray the presence of God and the provision of God and reminded that you're for us, not against us. You never leave, you never forsake us. Lord, this is my prayer in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Well, we're getting ready right now to receive the word of the Lord. We continue our series entitled Greater. I know that Pastor Dan's going to come. He's going to encourage you. You're going to be blessed. We're going to be challenged again. Would you lean in, ready to receive the word of God? Not just listening as if something we've heard before, but really praying and believing that God is going to speak to us in these moments. Because I believe he's in our God. So come on, church. Let's get ready to receive the word of God. Well, it's great to be able to continue our series today called Greater. I hope you found these last few weeks helpful. I hope as you've been listening to the words that you've heard, that your understanding, your knowledge, even your faith is growing greater. As we remind ourselves about who God is and what he is like, I pray that it is growing your faith, your love, your desire for him. Reminding ourselves of that scripture that we read in John chapter 3, when John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus, comes to that point where he has done his task, he's prepared the way for Jesus to come onto the scene and to start his public ministry. After he's done that, he concludes these words about Jesus, that he must become greater and I must become greater less. That should be the desire of every follower of Jesus, that Jesus becomes greater in our lives and that we become less. Jesus went on to teach this. He told us that if we are to be his followers, we are to deny self, take up our cross and follow him. It was a message that was countercultural. Even today, it still goes against the grain that if you want to gain the life that God has for you, then you've got to lose this life. But what God has for us is far superior and far greater than anything we could do in our own efforts. God is great. We cannot make him any greater but as we lean in and listen and learn about who he is, we can have a greater understanding, but also we can believe for greater in our lives. I wonder, are you facing a circumstance or a challenge? Is there something going on in your world right now? And if you're being honest, it's too big for you. It's too great. It's an impossible task. It feels like you're never going to see a turnaround. That there's never going to be a resolution to this problem. What do you do in these moments where you feel overwhelmed by what is happening? Or maybe you find yourself in a place where you feel like you're overlooked. It's almost like you've been forgotten. Does God see me? Is he aware of what is going on? in your life right now? What do we do in these moments? It's easy to throw a pity party and feel so sorry for ourselves. It's easy to feel um, burdened by the pressures and the struggles of life. But can I remind you today that God is with you in these moments and he's a great God. He is able to do the miraculous, to do the impossible. And my prayer for you today is we listen to God's word together that your faith will rise up within you and you will believe for greater in your life. If I was to ask you today, name one miracle that Jesus performed, I wonder what you would say. What's the first one that comes to your mind? He did incredible exploits as he demonstrated his power over nature, as he showed that he was greater even than the storm. He was able to bring that which was impossible into reality. He was able to bring the dead back to life and he still can do that today. But I think one of the most popular and famous miracles that he ever performed was the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus has crossed over the Sea of Galilee, Galilee with his disciples. They've been inundated with people surrounding them asking if Jesus could heal those that were sick. And they were impressed. They were blown away by Jesus' ability to heal the sick instantaneously. And they go together to prepare themselves for the Passover that was about to take place. 
And we pick up the story here in John's Gospel, chapter 6, and we're going to read together from verse 5. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will that go among so many? And Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took, took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over, by those who had eaten. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your amazing power. And Lord, in all those feelings and emotions that we're feeling and the things that we find ourselves caught up in right now, thank you, Lord, that you're aware of it all. And we look to you today. Speak to us through your word, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says here, that Jesus looked up. I think it's always significant when the gospel writers say those words because something has taken his attention. When Jesus went to pray to his Father in heaven, he would look up and he would listen to what his Father would say. But there are other moments where Jesus is maybe going about what he was doing, but there were times when something got his attention. And in this moment, as he sat around with his disciples, he looks up, and, and I just want to imagine right now, as he sat on that mountainside, that he maybe heard the footsteps of those, that large group of people, beginning to get closer and closer. Maybe he heard them shouting and calling upon him. Maybe he got, his attention was grabbed. And as he looked, he saw the people, the people who were coming. And in the midst of that crowd, I believe that he was aware of everything that was going on. He is all knowing, so he knew everyone. He knows the challenges in people's hearts. He knows the struggles in our minds. He knows what's going on in our everyday life. And I believe in that large crowd, he knew there was a small boy. You see, first of all, in this incredible miracle, there are things that we learn about Jesus, but there's also things that we should see, we should follow as we live with Jesus. First of all, we see that we are in his eyes. He sees you. You're not overlooked today. He sees you. In the midst of that crowd, which was 5,000 strong of men, there would also have been women, and children who were not counted at this time. And that small boy was overlooked by the disciples, but he was not ignored or missed by Jesus. Jesus knew that boy was in that crowd. And when he saw that crowd coming, he saw an opportunity. He saw a moment that he could use to test the faith of the disciples, but also to display his incredible power. And I love that this small boy set out that day, not knowing what was going to happen, not knowing that there would be a moment where his packed lunch would feed over 5,000 people and leave some leftovers. Jesus is looking today, even into your place, into your home, and he sees you. And when he looks today, he sees opportunity, he sees possibility, but I think he's also looking for faith. 
He's looking for faith in your heart to respond to him so that he can do something far greater than you could ever do by yourself. And that 5,000 strong crowd of even more, including the woman and the children, there was a little boy, a little boy that had a packed lunch. In our home now with Daniel being at school, some days he goes to school dinners and sometimes he, he likes a packed lunch and either me, mostly his mum, puts together that which he wants for his lunch, some bread, a sandwich, some snacks for that day. And he goes off to school with his packed lunch. Maybe you think back to school dinners and maybe they weren't the best when you were at school or maybe you prefer to take your lunch with you. But I'm sure when you went to school, you didn't make your packed lunch, someone made it for you. And in this story today, we learn about a little boy who had a lunch, but the Bible doesn't tell us about who made that lunch. Can we imagine today that conversation with that small boy when he got up that morning and he heard that people were going to find Jesus and they were seeking to see if he would maybe do another miracle. He would have been so excited. And maybe he turned to his mom and said, I want to go with the crowd. I want to see Jesus. I want to see him do that healing of the sick again. Could you imagine the excitement within him? And I'm sure his mother or whoever looked after him said, well, if you're going, you need to make sure you've got something with you. Because that could be a long day. And I guess the mom would have got together and got the bread got the fish, put it in that little bag and said, you're ready, you're ready to go and be with Jesus. See, in this story, I'd love to be the boy that gave his lunch to Jesus and did something incredible, fed all that people, but I think it would be great to be the person that made the lunch that day, who had no idea what was gonna happen but loved that boy so much and wanted to make sure that child had enough food for that day, but actually set him up to play a part in one of the most memorable miracles that Jesus ever performed, but also the strongest lesson that Jesus taught that he is greater and he is not limited by nature or natural solutions. I wonder, could you be like that person who made that lunch today? Could you invest in someone, maybe a little bit younger in the faith, maybe not as far on in the journey? I think of all our incredible volunteers who serve in our kids' ministries, and they are setting up this next generation. But I think of the families that are bringing their kids to church and living a life of discipleship and following Jesus, showing the kids the way so that there comes a moment when they meet with Jesus for themselves and they give not just their lunch, but they give their whole lives. And Jesus can do something incredible when we put our lives in his hands. So we see here that we are in his eyes, that we might feel overlooked by others, but we're never overlooked by Jesus. And Jesus then sees this opportunity as an opportunity to test our faith. And he asked this question, where shall we buy? And he, he, he says to Philip, he asked Philip because he was a local lad. He would have lived nearby here in Bethsaida and he would have known if there was a baker, if there was Uber Eats, if there was Deliveroo, if there was a drive through that they could have went and ordered all this food. But of course, it was an impossible task. And Jesus uses this moment to teach them a lesson and, and often tests in our life, maybe you're going through one right now, a test of your faith, we can feel like it's almost like God's trying to trick us or trip us up. Like why doesn't he just lift us out of that and we just plain sail through life? But what wisdom and experience teaches us is these moments of testing of our faith is when Jesus reveals to us something of himself or of his kingdom. Actually, going through a time of testing is a good sign 
It means that he wants to take you somewhere in a deeper sense of a relationship with him or setting you up, preparing you for something that's coming. So if you find yourself in a test right now, don't feel forgotten or overwhelmed or, or that you are maybe being tricked here by God. No, he's testing your faith because he wants to prepare you for what is next. He teaches him a lesson. And uh, friends, pay attention to these lessons in our lives. Don't wa waste a test. Learn from it. Apply what you've learned. And also, maybe in that, you'll have a greater understanding of who Jesus is. So we're in his eyes, but we're also in his mind. Because the Bible says that when he asked this question, he already had in mind what he was going to do. Jesus already knew what was going to happen. He knew that everyone was going to, going to go hungry that day. Everyone was going to have as much as they wanted and left over. He knew what was going to happen before it happened. And friend, it is no different today. He already had in mind what to do back then and he knows exactly what's going on today and you can trust in him. That he sees the end from the beginning. That he is all-knowing. That he is sovereign over all. And even in those unpleasant moments in life, when we look to him, when we put our trust in him, he will see us through, but you can trust that he knows what he's doing. God only knows all these things that we do not know when we can trust in him. I guess the struggle for us is how long will it take us to let go of trying to fix it all and sort it all out. Think how we're going to feed all these people, how we're going to make this happen and just put our trust in him. See, things in life can overwhelm us. Fears and struggles and situations that are ongoing. Things are piling up. It feels like there's no way out. It feels overwhelming. And Philip's response to Jesus actually shows us in this story, how great their need was. He says it would have cost half a year's wages to feed all these people. When was the last time you spent half a year's wages on anything, let alone one meal? It was an impossible situation that had no natural solution. And he shows this here, just how great their situation was. And they were overwhelmed. And in those moments, it's natural to try and limit God or pull him down into our thinking, it's going to cost half a year's wages. And we can forget, but we should do well to remember that he's a God of miracles, that he can do the impossible. When humanly, naturally, it seems impossible, he is able to do the miraculous. And here we see Andrew presents a boy, a little boy comes with small, five small, not even gigantic super size, small loaves, two small fishes. None of our fishermen ever catch small fish, I'm sure. But in this day, there was two small fish. And he presents them to Jesus. He says, this is it, this is all we have. And the little boy gave to Jesus all that he had. You see, Philip brought what couldn't be done, but the boy brought all that he had to Jesus. Philip knew that they didn't have enough, so brought nothing. But the boy, he didn't have enough, but he brought what he had. See, if you offer nothing to God, he's got nothing to work with. But even when you give him your little, he can do so much more than we could ever imagine. He is incredible. He can do greater with your little than you will ever manage in yourself. It's God that makes the difference when you take what you have and you put it in his hands. For friend, what are you putting into the hands of Jesus today? 
Is there something that you're holding on to? Maybe you're holding on to your stuff. Maybe you're holding on to your life and you've yet to submit and surrender and put your life into his hands. I pray today that you'll make that choice to wholeheartedly give your whole self to Jesus and he'll do so much more. Not only in his eyes, in his mind, but the invitation for us all is that we would be in his hands. You see, the boy gives his lunch and Jesus takes it into his hands. He tells the disciples, get everyone to sit down on the grass. There's plenty of space for everyone. And he takes that bread and he gives thanks and they break it and it multiplies. He does the same with the fish. And it was in his hands. We see here these principles. When we put, when we give to Jesus, we put it in his hands. We give thanks like he did. And then we give him the glory for what he's going to do. You see, he gave thanks. And it's so important that in our lives, we're thankful for what we do have. Maybe you're expecting and hoping and longing for more. But are you appreciative of what God has given to you already? And one of the ways that we show our appreciation is by confessing and acknowledging that all that we have is his already. And we give it back to him and we say, thank you. And then that attitude of gratitude, that grateful heart, that spirit that is acknowledging that he's the giver of every good thing. Then he sees our hearts as he looks at us. He sees our thankfulness. He sees our faith. He says, I can do something here. Like that little boy, he looks into you and he says, I can do something with this. And it's in his hands. I read this week for a quote that said, whatever we don't turn to praise turns to pride. I wonder, is there something in your life that you are maybe feeling like you've achieved it? You did it. You earned it. It's all been about you. Friend, can I maybe ask you to step back one more step? Because that little boy, he didn't make that lunch. He didn't think, I did all this. He didn't grind the grain or to make the flour. He didn't go and catch that fish. Somebody else did it for him. And in our lives, someone far greater, far bigger has done so much more for us. Every blessing that we receive and we experience, it flowed from our Father in heaven. So the boy was willing to give what he had to Jesus. And likewise today, I want to ask a question. Who's willing to give to Jesus today so that he can take what we have and do so much more. Who's willing to put their lives into his hands? That's the best place that you could ever be is in the hands of Jesus. He'll protect you. He'll care for you. He'll provide for you. And everything that he's promised is yours when we live our lives in his hands. Not off doing our own thing, pleasing ourselves, but a life submitted and surrendered to him in his hands. So you're not overlooked. You don't need to be overwhelmed because there's an overflow. I love here how it says that there's 12 baskets left over. Let nothing be wasted. These were not leftovers just to be discarded. This was a great picture and image of what God does when we give to him. There's always overflow. There's always more, not just for you, but for those around you as well. And my prayer for you today, that you will begin to see greater, that you will see the overflow that God has for you, but for the next generation, for those around you and those that are in your world. God does not want to do greater just in your life. He wants to do greater in all those around you as well. There's an overflow. These are not leftovers to be discarded. And Jesus says, let nothing be wasted. Nothing and his economy is ever wasted. And you may be putting it in his hands today. 
things that you feel guilty and shameful or you feel like you've messed up and all you've got is weakness today, all you've got is pain and struggle, all you've got is disappointment, all you've got is resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness and you need to put that into his hands today and release that and let it go because nothing is wasted. He can take the pain from your past. He can redeem it and he can make that a great testimony that will not just be a help to you, but to those that you will help as well. See, that's the shift when we go from just being that boy given the lunch to being the one who made the lunch for the boy. Come on, who is there in your world that you can make that investment in, in time and in love and encouragement that could set them up that one day they'll have an encounter with Jesus and they will be blown away by what? I will tell you, that little boy for the rest of his life told that story every opportunity that he got. Remember the time when my packed lunch fed 5,000 men and everyone else. There's an overflow and you can experience that as well. But today, I want to just land this on this thought that Jesus and his disciples were set apart at this point because they were preparing themselves for the Passover festival. And I think it's significant that John notes that because we know that in a year or so time when Jesus would come to lay down his life upon the cross, he would become the sacrifice for all our sins and he would be the one that through his death, every sin would be availed and forgiven. See, Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Uh, uh, today in your struggle and your pain, maybe Jesus hasn't been your solution. You've been looking to everything else. But the greatest need that each of us have today is that in our hearts, there's sin that we'll never be able to deal with by ourselves. But that's okay because Jesus came to deal with that. And when he gave his life upon the cross, he took your place and he took your sin and he took it upon himself. Just like he took that bread into his hands. He took your sin upon himself and he gave his last breath and died in your place so that his father in heaven would see his blood, would see his death and would forgive you of your sin when you put your faith in him. I wonder today, have you ever had a moment in your life where you've made this choice, this decision to realize that you're a sinner, you've done things that offend God. You know there's things in your life that you regret but also realize that Jesus is your savior, that he wants to save you from your sin, save you from yourself, save you from an eternity without him, and bring you into his family, to give you a new life, a new start, and the promise of eternal life with him forevermore. Maybe you have made a choice like that, but you have been honest, you've been doing your own thing. It's time to come back, and put your life in his hands, live according to his ways. If that's you today, can you pray this prayer sincerely? Say, dear Lord Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner and I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I turn away from my old life. Thank you that you died on the cross, but also you're risen from the dead. I confess you are my Lord. Make me a new person by your spirit and help me to follow you every day. In Jesus' name. If you prayed that today for the first time or maybe you've made this a moment to make a fresh commitment, can you let us know? We'd love to help you on your journey. You should come to Alpha. You'd love that. Every Thursday night, be a great experience for you to help you on your journey. But for everyone who's watching today, my prayer for you is that you have a greater understanding of who Jesus is and also who could you invest in this week? Set them up to encounter Jesus because he's the God of greater.
Thank you, Pastor Dan. What a timely reminder that we are in the hands of God. That reminded that we may be thinking, look at life and go about tasks that seem so insignificant in the moment, insignificant in the moment, but we never realize that these little things that we're doing, which is perhaps just the norm, that the difference that it can make in the life of others. I love when, when Pastor Dan said, the, you know, the mom that prepared the packed lunch, she would never have realized that day the impact it was going to have. I guess she'd made many lunches before. But the, what was different? It was in the hands of Jesus. And maybe you're going about life and perhaps just the same old day in, day out, familiarity is, is getting you down. Perhaps you wonder, does anyone see? Does it even make a difference? You never know. You never know the difference that you can make in the life of others. The Bible says, moreover, it's required in a servant that one be found faithful. There's something beautiful about faithfulness. And I guess that little boy, hey, I guess he probably had many meals on the back of telling the story about that meal that he gave to Jesus. Hey, what a challenge. What's in your hand? What do you need to release from your hand into the hand of our God? You know, in the hand of that boy, it was just a packed lunch. But in the hands of Jesus, it was a miracle to feed many. Hey, what are we holding on to that we need to release to him? What a blessing, what an encouragement, what a challenge. Now, if you responded at the end there, when Pastor Dan gave the invitation to ask Christ to come into your heart, would you put just simply in the text message there, I said yes, and someone will get in touch with you. Well, what a joy it is every Sunday to come into your home. But hey, we would also love for you to come into our home, which we call Apex Church. Every Sunday at 10.30, we have the opportunity to come together and just like you see on screen, we gather, we sing, we worship. We have a great community of family and friends, and we hear the word of God. Hey, we miss you, and we would love to see you here. Why don't you make that your intention? In 2024, perhaps you watched online, but here is my invitation personally to you. Come on, come along to Apex Church. Come and be part of family, friends, and what God is doing in our local community. Well, my prayer is that you're blessed, that the favor of God would rest upon you, that this week there would be a sense of the presence of God. Don't forget the words Pastor Dan shared with us. Hey, God wants to do something. He sees, he hears. But why don't you commit to him that which we hold in our hand? Let it be blessed in Jesus' name. Have a great week. Amen. You are for me, you're not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am.